I will apologize. <clears throat> I've been fighting off some allergies or a cold, I can't tell which. So if I'm sniffling, no Trump comparisons, please. <laughs> uh, I think Fair the enough. mic is working. Fair enough. All right. Uh, Dwight, last time you and I were on stage together, it was probably about 2012 when, when digital marketing was almost like this brand new, shiny, like what is that about mm -hmm. kind of thing. And here we are almost five years later. Yeah. And so I just want to start with sort of the broadest question. I mean, how far do you think digital marketing has come when it comes to the movie business? Boy, uh, you know, it's funny. The, the first thing I have to do is thank everybody in this room for the career that I've had in digital because <clears throat> most of the things that I've accomplished were really in collaboration with, with many of the folks here. Um, if you think about the studios in general, many executives who run studios and who are very senior um, are less digitally savvy than you would think or what? you would hope. Uh, you know, I, I, I liken them to, to climate change deniers, right? Uh, it's 80 degrees in October, it hasn't rained in 300 days, and we're still saying, you know, there's no climate change, and sometimes I feel like those are the conversations we've had about digital, where if I asked everybody in this room if they have a smartphone, everybody would say yes. And so, to me, that's indicative of a behavioral shift, right? So. So digital has become something that's, everybody here gets it, but uh, part of the fabric of behavior. And when we sat down in 2012, you know, we were talking about uh, what we thought was pretty groundbreaking, right? A report card where we tracked key performance indicators. We tracked, you know, five key measures to see how our campaigns were, were performing. And now data has just exploded in a way that, that's extraordinary. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of change, and uh, I think the studios are finally catching on and having consistent, um, consistent adoption of, of digital campaigns. So, um, talk me through what consistent adoption is. What what is sort of a typical overall campaign now that back in 2012 when we talked would have been unthinkable? Well, there's this you know this there's this conversation about seat at the table, right? We've all dealt with that. And if you were in something that was new, you had to beg for a share of voice and beg for a share of budget. Uh, now that budget share exists, the, 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 the battle that still is happening is how much, right? Do we lever up, do we lever down? And I think the shift that's happened most recently, I think, is that digital is now no longer expected to save the day, right? You're working on a movie campaign and all of a sudden they would do something digital, you know, save the day. It's got to be baked into the entire fabric of the campaign. And I think that's finally happened. And now it's just about, it's about share of budget. And, and I always say, you know, somebody asked me, um, well, what's the percentage? What's the proper percentage of digital? And, you know, my point of view is intent drives percent. Figure out what you're going to do. Figure out what you need to do. How many views? How many engagements? How do you measure that? What are you building? What are you not building? How much does it cost? and then derive the percentage out of that. Don't start with a percentage. Otherwise, you're gonna run out of cash <laughs> very quickly. Because uh, it's also not cheap. Everything that these folks do in this room, you know, we, you, they're scientists. Like, we're building software. There are data scientists here. There are content creators making little movies. None of this is cheap. But there was always this perception, oh, you know, throw digital at it for $2, save the day. <laughs> so. So, but surely there, there must be some rules for the road when you're budgeting in terms of, okay, comedies tend to play out like this, drama like that, the, the blockbusters like this. I mean, were there any sort of rules you walked away from? You know, the, the, the great news about most of my career in digital was that, you know, when we were having success, you could pretty much go build what you wanted to build, right? Make the campaign have all of the things that you needed to have. And, the, and in the early days, there wasn't a science. You know, we actually said, let's do all of this. And then we found out some of it was noise and very little of it was signal. And, and you have to sort of make those decisions. But uh, everybody in the room knows that when you're laying out a campaign, uh, it all starts with, with, a, with, a, with a premise, right? With a, with a point of view, with a thesis. And that thesis can be executed in publicity, and now publicity is digital, 
in creative advertising, and creative advertising is digital, um, in research, and we talked about data for a second, and that's all digital. So, um, you know, I think, I, I think that's still an, a, an evolution right now, how people are gonna build campaigns for the future. Um, uh, when I look back on some of the things we did at Sony, I look at a, a movie like Sausage Party that was opening as I was exiting, um, and great success. The, the movie's at about $97 million. Um, I'll take some small credit for that. <laughs> I didn't want my legacy to end on a movie called Sausage Party. <laughs> right? So I, I said, let, let me leave after Ghostbusters. Um, but one, one of the things that the team found out was that some of the content, the nature of the movie was so R-rated, you couldn't run that stuff on TV. And digital was a place where you could actually get it done and be true to the movie and therefore convince moviegoers about what experience they were gonna have. And I think that's a great example of using the medium in the right way, in a smart way. Let's get back to the data piece because I, I, I would imagine it's still, you know, coming into 2017, studios must be struggling with how do you take all this data in, all this information in and make sense of it, sometimes make sense of it in real time. Do you think as your time at Sony, you know, o over the years that the studio got better and better at that? Is that still a challenge, do you think, for a lot of studios? Um, I will say very frankly, <clears throat> having been there almost two decades, with every new boss, there was a new point of view about how you use the stuff. And so there was, you were, felt like you were hitting the reset button and starting over on some level because most of the senior management in a company, myself included, when we're all digital uh, immigrants, we're not digital natives, I migrated to digital. I mean, I had cassette tapes when I was a kid, right? And so the future of the studio, the, the studio's gonna be run by digital natives. And at some point, the studio's just gotta adopt this behavior and, and own it and say, this is, this is the way it's gonna go. But, you know, I think that I started in research, and when we were doing research, we were measuring customer behavior with data. And when we migrated to digital uh, as a company, you had a lot more data. And one of the things I find that is a little bit of a challenge for me is people are talking about the data points, forgetting that there's a person on the other side of that data point. I mean, it's really about audience. It's not about you know streams or engagement or likes or, those are people taking action. And I've not heard enough conversation about the people taking the action. I've heard about the actions we want, but we keep forgetting, these are moviegoers, right? We've gotta promise something and deliver on it when they plunk down their eight, 10, 15 bucks to go see our movies. Um, but uh, I, listen, I, I, I'm very excited, and I've, I've told a couple of people, sitting on the other side of the wall. What the, wall? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Another Trump joke. Yeah, another um, <laughs> sitting on the other side of the wall, looking in, I'm probably the most dangerous moviegoer there is now. Because right? so. I'm evaluating campaigns, thing. oh, they think they're gonna get me. I know what that movie really is. Um, but, but it's very exciting what's happening. And I think there is a movement um, within the media groups and within the digital groups to figure out what's the best use of data. Right? How do we, how do we uh, understand what the customer's doing and make them want to see our movies? Okay. And, you know, I think social platforms are a big place where that data is coming in. It's, it's fascinating to me watching campaigns and how they play out differently, say, on a Facebook or, or, or a Snapchat. Uh, talk a bit about the evolution there uh, and how you have to sort of be, I, I guess, very aggressive when it comes to you know, what's the latest thing, right. Snapchat, or Musical.ly, uh, in terms of understanding what I would guess would be different rules on different platforms. Yeah, you know, I think uh, in the beginning of our digital exploration, we measured everything the same way, right? You just said, how much am I getting? How many uh, impressions am, am I getting? We called them hits back then. <laughs> um, and now every platform measures things differently. So, you know, I worked in the movie business for two decades, and that's a moving picture business, right? We, we, we sell moving pictures, and yet you'll meet with companies and they'll tell you that a view of content 
happens in three seconds, and that's good. Well, if I built a narrative in three seconds, yeah, that's great, but most of our narratives are longer. And what it's forced us to have to do is change the structure of the content we're building for each platform so that we can maximize how the consumer engages, maximize views, but everything's being measured differently. Um, and the other thing that's surprising, especially to the, the, the climate denier, is climate change denier, is most of the, the content that people are viewing, a high percentage of it, you guys all know this, 80% of it is, is viewed at least initially without sound. And so these guys are all creating content, putting words and copy and taking the best parts of a trailer and slapping it into the front to try to get somebody to come in. And it's creating havoc among the traditional creative people at studios because they're like, that's my art, what did you do? The closest thing to art in the movie business is the movie. The rest of it is advertising, right? And while advertising requires artistic ability, <laughs> advertising's not art. This is art, we're in an art gallery, right? <laughs> so I, you know, my, I guess if I had a complaint, it was that every time you spend any money to reach a consumer, max out that impression. There's a fantastic uh, piece of outdoor for, I think it's fantastic, for, for Westworld. Right? The Vitruvian Man. It's a riff on the Vitruvian Man with a synthetic person and the W for Westworld. I think it's brilliant because the outdoor explains the concept of the show. The tagline is brilliant. And the tagline, every, every hero, hero has, has a code. code. Great tagline, oh, right? That's great. So we've spent time looking at this, but, they're, but I'm going, where's the digital call to action? Where's the thing that immerses me in the, in the welcome to Westworld chat bot? which I thought was a pretty good experience on my mobile device. Why aren't we pushing? Because somebody may have said, um, don't muck it up with that call to action. It's perfect the way it is, right? <laughs> um, and that's the challenge. I think we have to be okay with understanding that advertising takes artistic ability, but it's not art. It's advertising, right? It's, it's, it's supposed to do something. So, um, you know, we're now, we've all experimented with, with different platforms. Um, some platforms get more share of budget than others because of what they do, right? And, it, you know, some of them deliver video, and video is incredibly important. Uh, and those guys might be favored in terms of share of budget. But we're also trying to create conversations among consumers who influence other consumers. And so that's why we continue to experiment and continue to chase all of the available platforms. I have to say, um, I, I, I don't know how to use, where's Luke? I don't know how to use Snapchat. <laughs> Luke came in, Luke showed everybody, Luke's on Snap, I, I don't know how to use it. My kids, you know, and, and it's made for them, it wasn't made for me. And I think that's okay too. Um, and that's something that we have to recognize as we, as we move forward and we, and we try to use these platforms. If you don't feel a responsibility, like you have to get to know Snapchat, doesn't matter if it's for, if it's for your kids, you gotta understand every platform that comes along. We don't try. <laughs> that's right. We've tried so far. <laughs> you tried, that's A right. for effort. That's I mean, well, that's why I hired a bunch of millennials, right? <laughs> I mean, they let them figure it out. <laughs> Yeah. Right? I mean, listen, most of the, I, I, I have to say, it's really daunting. You're standing behind the wall and people are saying all these amazing things about you. Most of the people in this room who I worked with know that if there was an idea that had passion behind it, and the idea was in service of connecting an audience to a movie, I went for it. And I would always say, I'll chase good ideas with money. And, you know, I have to rely on people smarter than myself, and what they need for me is, or what they needed for me was, to be the loud voice in the room, knocking shit out of the way, moving ob obstacles out of the way so they could get it done. And that's, I think that takes a little bit of humility, of which I don't have much. Um, you know, you have to say, you're smarter than me, if you say this platform works, and, and you know, the room says it works, we gotta go for it, we have to do it. So I don't have a responsibility to learn how to use Snapchat. <laughs> Unless they call me for a job, then I gotta figure that out. <laughs> There's a lot of that going around these days. <laughs> um, well, another good thing, uh, you know, sometimes on social is its ability to target audience segments in a way that, you know, in the olden days of billboards and commercials may have been a little harder uh, to accomplish. 
I mean, did you, was that a big value add for social and, and, and using that? It is, except, right, if it, there's a, there's a, I think a, um, a, a prevailing thought in the movie studios that if you're an executive and you're responsible for opening a movie at whatever level in the company and you don't see it, it's hard to believe that it's happening, wow. right? And that's why you, you put a billboard on the way to the studio when you're having a meeting with a filmmaker so that he can see you know, his art up there. So when very often we'd said, you know, it could be really efficient to buy these consumers in this particular way on these platforms, but if a senior executive couldn't see it, I can't tell you how many meetings we were all in defending that, yes, real people saw it, the right people saw it. And so that, I don't know when that's gonna get resolved. Uh, I'll be watching from the other side of that wall. Uh, but hopefully it gets resolved soon. You've gotta take risks. I mean, listen, the, the, business is, the business is changing so rapidly. All of the shows I watch, I don't even know when they come on because they're all on the DVR. Or I'm watching over the top and there's no commercials, you know? Um, and if we're gonna rely on TV spots to open movies, we're gonna, we're gonna fade away, right? We're gonna be obsolete as a, as a movie industry. That's not the way to move into the future. We've gotta track behavior. Um, and I, you know, that's, that's, I think the job has always been evangelizing. That, that never ends. And that's also part of the fun. Well, what does that say about your attitude towards these traditional studios, the world you came from? I mean, would you go back to one in a, in a, in a marketing, uh, or is it? <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any offers at this time? Funny, no. Um, listen, I've 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 often said to people that I've interviewed, right, when they were coming into the company, you get one chance to pick your boss the minute you join the company. I've probably had ten bosses at Sony over the twenty years, nineteen years I've been there. You get one chance to pick the boss, and if the boss says something that you think you can buy into, and the company feels like a company you want to join, you join it. So if I sit down with a studio to talk about a job, I'm gonna be evaluating, does this person have the kind of vision that's gonna get me excited? I mean, I've been around for a long time and I still long to have a mentor, right? I love it when I'm not, you know, again, you call me the smartest person in the room. I'm not the smartest person in the room. I love someone who's smarter who says, that's good, but let's do this now to make it great. Um, and so if, if the right opportunity comes along, um, yeah, I'll, I'll absolutely have that conversation. But I, I have the luxury now of being kind of choosy and, and, and taking some time to think about that. Cool. And I mean, in, I'm, I'm curious, 19 years, were, was there any one campaign that was just sort of, you know, a watershed for you, a milestone for you in terms of the power of digital marketing? You know, I loved, always loved what we did on the Da Vinci Code um, because it was a book that <clears throat> was, was perceived to be for older consumers. And what we did was we, we built something that was targeted to what we called College Plus. We literally capped the program at just shortly having graduated. Um, and it was tech driven and puzzle driven. And it was the first time that Google had ever worked at that scale. I mean, you had to log in. So now you have a single sign-on for all your Google um, products. In the past, it was, it was a Google gadget, as they called it. And it was not the easiest thing in the world for us to work with. But they built it custom for us to, to do something that, we'd never, that they'd never done before. And that campaign, to me, I think, was groundbreaking because we took a big company as a partner and said, come in and, and help us reach consumers. And I always look back at that because the, the product, the project team on that was probably about 50 people to get that thing done. Um, and that was exciting. That was very exciting. Well, you know, fast forward to 2016, it's so interesting now how VR and AR are such a big part of the conversation. Was that something that you got to experiment with? And what's, what's your general take on where, where that is? We did experiment with it. And what I found was to produce high quality VR cost money, <laughs> right? Cost money. And in my experience, it was always launching two minutes before the movie opened. 
<laughs> right? And it was hard to scale. So it's like, okay, how do we get people to get this headset on and have enough of an experience for it to move the needle in terms of intent to see? Uh, I love it as an experience. It's a great narrative storytelling experience. It is tough as a marketing device. And I think, you know, PlayStation, you know, just came out with some news about their headset and the, the, it's at an affordable price point. And if you're a PlayStation user, you know, gaming is, is really going to be, is really going to be exciting. Uh, with VR. AR, I think, is a lot less, there's a lot less friction, right? Everybody's got a smartphone, and if, if this art was an AR trigger, we could actually opt everybody in this room into a campaign right now. And to me, that's exciting. We can do that cheaply, and the expectation is set at a range where people say, oh, that was fun, you know? They're not expecting something so amazing that it's gonna change their life. But I, I'm going to be watching both carefully. I mean, I, there are a lot of interesting players uh, working in, in both of those spaces. Um, you heard, you know, Jason and his group have been working in AR uh, for a very long time, and we've done a number of campaigns with them. And what I like about that is the scalability of it uh, and, and how wide-reaching it can be. Were there other next big things, hot trends in, in that last year at the studio that were like, this is something people got to keep an eye on? Well, you know, everybody's talking about programmatic, right? You know, sort of addressable advertising. And, you know, in the past, even while I've been uh, away from Sony, I've, I've happened to have been in a number of conversations about that. And, and you meet companies who <coughs> are all doing a variation on the same theme, right? Elias said it uh, when, he, when he did the intro. It's okay that more than one company's doing it. And the good news about that is that means there will be adoption. If one person's doing it, they're probably, you know, they're probably going to end up not having a great deal of success. Um, it, it, the conversation, though, is interesting because some people talk about addressable advertising as something that can be self-optimizing almost to the point where a human never has to touch it. And I think that is the is the trap. When you when a when a human marketer stops actually looking at it, I just think that's a trap because there's nuances to messaging. Uh, why things are getting engagement. We always have to have a human touch, but I'm, I, I think it's, it's exciting because it's taking uh, what we do and moving it to the, next, to the next level, really scaling our ability to reach consumers. I just think you have to have human touch in there. Hmm. You know, if there was one constant in, in 19 years of a lot of change, I'd say the centrality of the theatrical experience, you know, at the forefront, uh, of the campaign uh, for any movie, uh, that didn't change. And I'm curious, as you look to the next 19, or not, maybe not oh, 19, wow. 19 months, <laughs> um, do, you, do you see that sacred theatrical place changing? I mean, that's a tough question to say on the record with press and everything. We're all friends, I mean, not Listen, everyone. <laughs> you know, I, one of the reasons why, um, you see new models, right? John Hegeman's here, right? John is a guy who I think has been uh, somebody that I've worked with, looked up to, who has pioneered alternate models of getting movies made and opened. I think that has to happen. I think um, the business has to get leaner and smarter and nimbler. And uh, it, it just has to because consumers have so many choices uh, and the studio systems can't rely on tent poles only, right? So the company I left, Sony, has a label structure, and the hope there is that each of those labels produces a movie for an audience that will allow the studio to take certain risks. Some will be tent poles, some will be filmmaker driven, some will be you know smaller genre or targeted. I think those kinds of things are really important, but you must adhere to that strategy because things are changing so fast. Um, but I, I think you know, there are some exciting things happening. Um, you look at a movie like Bad Moms, right? Uh, I don't know what that movie cost to make, but pretty inexpensive, got to $100 million um, from a, a, a small studio, you know, STX. And I think that kind of success kind of puts people on notice and makes you stop and go, wow, you know, that movie's at 100 with a small startup of a, of a studio. That's very interesting to me. Well, let's put it this way. If we saw came to a time where theatrical was 
a, a lesser piece of the puzzle. How radical a shift does marketing need to support that new world? Does everything change or maybe nothing? The question that I think plagues the business and there are various interests that stop this conversation from advancing is, is the release pattern, right? You know, when, do, when does the consumer get to have the product at home versus on screen? That's the thing that, you know, we've got to really figure out in this business. When do you want to let people enjoy it at home? And if they're enjoying it at home, how many people are they loading up into the room, right? And are we able to make the money that we deserve to make from this product if there's 30 people, 30 millennials <laughs> crowded around, right? Because, because it's cheaper to do it that way. But that's the conversation. Okay. Um, now that you're, uh, you know, left more free time than when you had Sony on your plate. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> what, what are you seeing out there that excites you? Uh, an interesting marketing campaign? Maybe it's not even a movie. What, what sort of? Well, I'll tell you what I saw that excited me today was uh, uh, my 13-year-old catching two touchdowns uh, at his, his school flag football game. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, I've been spending a lot of time, you know, reconnecting with, with, with my family and watching very carefully what some of the studios are doing. And, um, you know, again, we talked about VR and AR. That's certainly very interesting. Um, I think that there's a combination of data uh, and media innovation that uh, is happening everywhere. Um, I, I, I'm seeing walls come down between divisions. The, the digital group used to be a standalone division somewhere off somewhere else. It is now uh, not the case in Everywhere. most, in my experience, in most studios. However, there's still a little bit of a tug of war about who controls the budget, right? Who, who controls the spending. Um, but uh, listen, it, it's, uh, it's an exciting time. It's, a, it's an exciting time for me to be um, outside of the studio looking at the great work that these folks are doing because uh, I'm a student again. Um, and, and that's that's an exciting time for me. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. Appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you.